Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape oil painting demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy. And the painting I'm bringing you today is called Afternoon Paddock. It is an 8x12, and I painted this, uh, finished it yesterday. I've been working on it for the last week. Um, in the members area, it's about it's about a five hour long video, which is a bit you know, longer than I like to take on a painting this size. But uh, we had some little fiddly bits in the house and things. And, you know, uh, all in all, I'm very happy with the way the painting came out. And uh, I think you might enjoy watching it. So we are painting on uh, a bit of hardboard that has been prepped with two good coats of transparent gesso. I had a uh, comment on the channel uh, recently, someone asking, why are you painting on raw board? And it does look like raw board. So I like to get that out there. Now you've got to have some sort of buffer between the board and the oil paint. It's not a good plan to paint on raw board because the paint will get absorbed into the board over time. And that is going to be very sad, especially if it's a really nice painting eventually it'll disappear into the board and we don't want that so you gotta have a buffer coat there in the old days of course they didn't have acrylic gesso they had uh yeah they had their chalk gessos and things like that and um, marble dust rabbit skin glue what have you uh we're doing a drawing uh slash underpainting stage with some burn number and uh, sometimes i vary that i've been messing around with uh Adding a little perylene black to that burn number with some good results. It depends. Like this is a overall going to be a very warm looking painting. You saw the little preview image at the beginning. Uh, when I have that image ready, I like to throw that in the front. Um, so you can see where we're headed. And um, yeah, there, you know, having a bunch of red peeking around things. It's all good. There are times of certain scenes where I don't want that, and that's where I'll adjust. Uh, either I'll just use straight up black, or I like this new color um, a member of the channel sent me, the Paraline Black. It's uh, definitely um, really cool, and I've been having some fun with it. And it's a neat color. It's kind of like a phthalo green, but really a subdued way. Um, I was sort of wondering if I could replace uh, Thalo Green on my palette, but I can't. Uh, I did use a little, I use a little Thalo Green probably in every painting because there are times uh, that uh, you just need that, that green, the greeny green green. Um, on my palette is though the permanent green light, which um, is basically Thalo Green mixed with acrylide yellow um, in Gamblin's brands called Hansa Yellow. Or if you have a tube of what's called CAD yellow light, usually it's that acrylide yellow, um, which is also a, a prominent player in my mic screen. Now, if you're hungry for more information about color, I know many of you are, um, you want to go ahead and just <clears throat> join the members area. It's about six bucks, which is pretty reasonable. In fact, this painting would be a great one to watch. I know it's quite long. But I think I'm getting better at talking while I'm painting and trying to share my insights in the decision making process as I paint. And you know, you may not really think about it this way. I'm, I'm assuming you're interested in painting yourself um, and that's why you've come around. Although I think probably pretty relaxing just to watch a painting come together, even if you're not a painter yourself. But uh, I digress. Um, that thought process you know um, there are so many decisions that have to be made like in a painting like this it's it's in the thousands I, I don't think we're getting into millions or anything but thousands decision what what's what type of stroke which direction of stroke what color um, the color itself how dark how light how saturated uh, or how much color um, or unsaturated that stroke might be um, and of course, all the interrelations, everything is absolute. Every decision you make in a painting is absolutely related to every other aspect of the painting. So, uh, nothing, uh, no decision is made in isolation. Um, and it's endless. You make endless decisions. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I painted this over maybe a two or three day period. And um, I find, uh, you know, uh, depending on the subject matter and where I'm at, maybe I could do a couple little minis in a day you know um, but for actual solid painting like you see me doing here I'm good for maybe three four hours tops and generally it's more like two 
um, and uh, other and I paint every day so I have you know a studio full of paintings um, maybe three maybe four it depends but my point there being is because of this uh, nearly endless array of decisions that you have to make um, it requires to be a little fresh there are times when I'm trying to push through and finish a painting at the end of the day um, and what I've sort of learned to do is just not to do that because that finish is so important because you're stacking decisions on top of the multitude of decisions that came before and you have to be very respectful of those decisions it's quite easy to um, start ignoring previous decisions thinking uh, especially you getting a little um, what's the word a little frustrated a little exasperated uh, maybe you had things going well and now they're not going well and you're just slapping the paint down hoping something uh, will will miraculously happen to make the painting good and that can happen it usually doesn't happen though I uh, recommend that finishing uh, phase should be very mindful and very respectful of the work that's come before. Um, one of the things I'm always bringing up in the members area, and what's great about the members area, is you're, you're there with me in the trenches. We are duking it out. Oh, let's do a little break for my, my book. You're not getting a lot of orders. Maybe we've hit all the folks that are interested, but uh, if you are interested, I recommend uh, checking it out. It's um, sixty dollars. Most of that is uh, where that's a bit expensive U.S. Um, but most of that, unfortunately, is uh, going for international shipping. A big portion of it, um, maybe thirty dollars or something like that. Um, and then my cost on the small run is is pretty high as well. Um, but get it if you want it. It'd be worth it. You 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 won't regret it. It's collectible. <laughs> There's only gonna there's so far there's only a hundred in existence so um yeah so the uh, little story about this uh this scene is that it is a commission piece I have a student and her um, son um, saw several of my paintings um, where I had a little house and he's like oh I like that it reminded him of of this and uh, I'm not sure whether it's his land or a place he lives or someone he knows. But um, he sent me the reference photo, and I thought it had a lot of potential. One of the things I did, though, to make there's several things I did to make it work. Um, one, his photo was vertical. I painted this as a horizontal, just focusing on the the house itself. Um, if you were to look at the reference photo, and you have access to that in the members area, um, the house is way smaller in the landscape, and there's a big area of grass, which I would call a bunch of nothing. And uh, we'll talk about that when we get a little further in the video I have some insights for you hopefully to help you with that but um, one of my strategies was to link the the house was already nestled up against as that dark tree mass um, and already kind of touching a tree but I really wanted to re-emphasize the link between those elements to kind of create a composition where it's a little bit of a circular thing and then you've got a sort of a bar coming out from the middle with a bunch of connected things and um, the area that's on our left um, in the reference photo was quite choked up so I opened that up so that we could get in and get around there and breathe a little bit get around that tree having that tree right up against the edge was would not be good for a painting um, and these are strategic decisions you make and really so many of the most important decisions you make in your painting are compositional if the composition's good the shapes are good um, you're all right you know you could the color could be a little off the values could be a little off but you're probably still going to be all right if by composition I mean how the large forms interact with each other far more important than the small forms you could sit there and that's one thing um, painters starting out tend to do a lot of is they start to they sweat the details they sweat all the little stuff and they got a photo reference and they think oh if I copy every little bit of this over exactly like the reference I'll have a good painting and now what you're gonna have is like a stiff painted version of a photo that falls usually well short of the photo itself um, and will not be judged the same way as a photo because people have different expectations of painted images than they do of photography they will scan a photo the same way they scan reality itself which is leaving out tons of detail yeah so 
um, made the house bigger, the grass. So let's talk a little bit about the grass. Now you might think the, and I have done in the past, and you can even find it in the channel itself, the, the, the myriad of little jits, you know, little vertical jits. There is some of that that's used here, but I want you to uh, be aware um, that I use the side of a brush a lot for the grass, thinned down with the appropriate amount of oil. And this gives you kind of a vertical stroke that's a little wider and more expressive and has some characteristics from where you start and where you stop the stroke. The problem with the dash, dash, dash thing, and it can work, but it has a, it takes on a sensibility that maybe becomes um, stiff or a little overly graphic or a little, you know, the, the thing is like with that side brush stuff, I do bring in some, some jots here and there that are, little vertical jots and I did pick like sort of a direction for the grass as well which is a very slight uh, I'm not so good at remembering my angles but maybe a you know a 20 degree angle don't quote me you know somebody's got a better head for that stuff could tell you what the angle is it's very slight a very slight uh, slanted angle um, and I was very happy with the way the grass turned out um, also, you note in the grass that I put in these darker patches, and they're a bit darker than in the reference, but you want to have something, so you're not just, you don't want to start plopping the darker bits on top of the lighter bits. You want to plop the lighter, <laughs> plop. You want to paint the lighter bits over the darker bits, and that gives you, because what are those darker bits? It's like maybe a bit of dirt, dirt that would be peeking up under the grass. Could be even something in the grass. Could be a log or um uh, a bit of uh, weeds or, or anything like that. Um, so getting into the house and my strategy there, um, lots of detail in that house, although it was a very simple, uh, I don't want to call it a shack, I don't know, um, I don't think it is, it seems to be in good nick, but um, I'm looking for the variations of color, like I chose sort of a purple scheme for the part of the house, it's facing us, it's in shadow. Um, there's going to be a little window, uh, which is one of those little fiddly things I hate to paint, but um, had to go in there. It was very important. And um, I just instead of like a, there's like a texture on the roof, which I didn't acknowledge too greatly, I just looked to paint the variations of tones that I saw on the roof. Also, there were lines on the side of the house that were to paint them, it would have stiffened things up. And so what I'm very aware of is like with a, a loose expressive landscape like this where you have a man-made thing in it, um, you need to make an effort to not be overly stiff when you come to that man-made item. You have to kind of let the paint breathe a bit. And uh, I'll get better at that. And this is probably, I mean, you know, you've, if you've been on the channel any time at all, you can see I, I'll go after little houses and things. Um, you know, once in a while, but usually I put them into the very iconographic. It's just a little roof and the side of a house, and maybe I do a little like dot, like I just did for the window there. This window is going to get a little, a little white window sill, um, as you see I'm painting there. And now um, you'll see me do it, but there you can see how I tapped it. So that's in the shadow. You don't want that too white or too bright, and I had to keep tapping it. I had to kind of work a bit on it. I also you notice I'm using a very small little staple brush. See, I have a little piece of paper on my finger there. I'm tapping it and then bringing it back up. Um, I'm trying to keep it very subtle so it falls in because it's got to be there. It won't be the, the same house uh, without it. But if it's too facey, if it's too in our uh, face, um, it won't work. So that was one of the challenges. Generally, too, I avoid fence posts, but here they served a very good compositional purpose of sort of keeping us fenced in to the composition. So that was pretty brilliant. And uh, I, I did move the uh, posts around a little bit from the reference, but all of this is riffing off the reference. And it was, I could tell I could make a painting from it right off the bat. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed watching me see this. And, uh, um, really enjoyed the opportunity to paint such a beautiful scene and uh, uh, hopefully uh, you got something from this at least normally I don't do like big fields full of grass it's been a while so it was good to try some new ideas anyway until I come back with another video for your hopefully for your edification and enjoyment do me a favor do me a solid take good care of yourself 
treasure your family and all your loved ones you know if you're if you're fighting with anyone just let it go just let it go just be the bigger person okay and uh, while you're doing that uh, take good care of yourself and your family and your loved ones do your best to stay out of trouble and God bless you and your family.